bit. Greetings, fellow nerds, and thank you, thank you for joining us for another episode of Between Two Nerds. I'm Jeff Doyle, and with me is my friend, as always, Jeff Tensura. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. Great to see you. Great to be here again. We took a pause. We both attended ATF. I did a lot of productive stuff. So we are back to you. Yeah, we both traveled, uh, what, 12 hours to uh, get to a spot uh, where we could uh, basically, I think we spent about five minutes saying hi to each other in the hall. And <laughs> that was the most time we spent together. But that was a, ter a terrific time. Yep. So we are continuing our networking hardware session. This time we are joined by Gollum from Broadcom DNX, who is going to talk about... Uh, similarly to other speakers, about evolution of silicon, past, present, future. Golan is very well known in silicon ecosystem, been around forever, one of the best people to talk about. And without further ado, Golan, please take it over. Golan, thanks for okay. joining us. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. Thanks for in, uh, inviting me. So I will uh, kind of... Uh, take a, some kind of an angle of what we've been doing in uh, DNX uh, for the, I mean, trying to summarize 20 years and, and where we are going. So I would kind of look at it as starting from uh, chassis solutions and now uh, focusing on, uh, um, focusing on uh, uh, moving into machine learning disaggregated networks. So we support, of course, both, but this is kind of what we see the future for us. Um, so in terms of the traffic management, so what, what we've done, so we built uh, a deep, under, uh, we built uh, the chassis with deep understanding of uh, MSDC and service provider network uh, and their needs and trends. Um, so uh, uh, most of our team came from system companies uh, and having understanding of what uh, a, a networking system should look like and what is the advantages, etc. So uh, the the idea was to build a, a lossless and high utilization fabric to carry any workload. Um, and at the beginning, it's kind of a lot of uh, service provider requirement, which were, let's say, the baseline for the uh, for the first years, maybe 2006 uh, or even before. So uh, the idea was to build a fabric that can handle any uh, any uh, traffic pattern. So we had to think about how to do a very efficient uh, communication between line cards. So uh, to do that we decided to do perfect load balancing. And uh, to, to achieve that, instead of doing per flow uh, load balancing, we did the uh, kind of cell spraying, which is, uh, allows you to use all the available paths to the destination. Um, and, and this way to have uh, the most efficient load balancing possible. Um, should, we have our, should we have the slides up? Um, oh, you don't see the slides? No, I don't see the slides yet. Oh. There we go. Yep. Great. Okay, yeah. So how do I move with the slides? Is this uh, when I move this mode? Uh, okay. Uh, um, maybe I need to do this one here. When I'm in the present, I mean in the video, I'm kind of cannot move the slides. So I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe when I move to the presentation okay, side, page do down, you see now part. as well? Or? Yeah, we see it in presentation mode. OK. Yeah, and uh, and I think the second part was uh, to, to have an efficient uh, fabric. Uh, um, the idea is to do receiver-based end-to-end scheduling, which means that uh, traffic is not pushed from the source to the destination rather than uh, the destination schedule the traffic from all the sources so uh everything that goes to a destination is not oversubscribed it's scheduled so the fabric itself is very uh, efficiently utilized and not congested so you can 
have a very efficient fabric in this way and and also the implementation is kind of uh, allows you the egress card to uh, to have I mean you, to have something which is more efficient because you don't need a lot of buffers in the egress card because it's just the right adaptation um, to to kind of make the whole solution there is uh, of course a fast end to end congestion control in case there is some intermittent congestion so we can resolve that very quickly um, and on top of that, uh, there is a self-healing uh, mechanism that for any failure, the hardware is uh, very quickly understands that and uh, uh, reports and over kind of bypasses all the failure paths or failure devices. Uh, so this is very quickly uh, done, uh, like uh, hundreds of microseconds order of hundreds of microseconds rather than um, ECMP convergence, which takes uh, like uh, maybe hundreds of milliseconds or more. So Galan, you are describing current VRQ architecture, right? Sorry? You are describing current VRQ architecture utilized by DNX devices, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of describing the, the natures of the architecture, of course, to implement that we have VOQ based in the in the source uh, and uh, we have the schedule of the destination um, I mean I I didn't uh, plan to go over the whole packet uh, pass but uh, or packet flow but if it's interesting well, we uh, VOQ before also try to explain kind of difference between shallow and deep buffer switches so just so our listeners understand what you're describing here okay okay yeah. So uh, this is the characteristics which allows us to, to build a very efficient uh, fabric, meaning that uh, um, the switches or the fabric switches that uh, I mean, creates the communication between the line cards which holds the network interfaces um, allows uh, the, the fabric to be very simple because all the smartness are on the edges everything is distributed so uh, it allows to build a very efficient uh, fabric so this is kind of the baseline uh, on top of that we added the deep buffers so uh, in many service provider application there is a need for uh, uh, absorbing kind of uh, tens of milliseconds of burstiness if there is congestion so uh, um, we have this deep buffers and it happens to be the the case that also in very um, different uh, data center or data center interconnect uh, application it's also relevant um, so this is kind of the baseline of the architecture and uh, kind of to talk about the evolution and, and where we kind of, uh, this is kind of the 10, the last, uh, let's say 12 years. There are of course, uh, maybe another one like that for the previous 10 years. So we actually started with the devices that um, uh, only do the fabric and traffic management. They didn't have any packet processing. And uh, um, a few generations before that slide, we started to add uh, also packet processing function, which means that uh, the whole uh, function is integrated into a single device, so you can kind of build a line card. Uh, on the line card. So the, the Petra, Ra, Jericho, these are the line card devices. And uh, FE and Ramon are the fabric devices. And you can see the, I mean, we talk about Moore's Law, I think uh, we managed to kind of uh, uh, outpace it uh, in the last few years or last 10 years. You can see that uh, the cadence is about two years between uh, generations. And uh, there are some cases we are 2x, sometimes more, but it get it's getting kind of more and more challenging. Uh, so you can see the, the scaling of the Jericho devices. So currently this is the 
Jericho 2C Plus is the deployed device uh, that we have uh, today, and we are coming very soon with this uh, Jericho 3 that will be uh, kind of announced very, very soon. And the fabric devices, we kind of have the same cadence, uh, or sometimes even more. So this is, um, these are devices that are very, very simple, very low power and can uh, kind of, uh, one of the scaling capabilities that we have is allowed by these Ramon devices. So this is kind of the cadence and... Um, Do you expect fabric devices to become more complex as you evolve speeds and they introduce distributions to them? So, um, um, the way that we build these devices is uh, allows us to scale. So I don't think we need to make them more complex, uh, even sometimes maybe simpler. Uh, I think the idea is to be able to integrate as much bandwidth uh, as, and the more bandwidth that you can integrate into this uh, cell switches, Ramon cell switches, is the, gives you the ability to scale or to get a bigger radix to scale uh, faster. So uh, I think sometimes uh, in the presentation, you are going to talk about distributed systems. So now your fabric devices are significant distance away, right? And they're connected by fiber, not by traces anymore. So yeah. you need to introduce some recovery. You need to make sure the timing is right. Do doesn't yeah. introduce more complexity. Yeah, so the, it's a good point. It's not uh, changing the, the feature set. It, it does, uh, if you want to traverse uh, bigger distances or cables, it does uh, <coughs> justify more, more buffering uh, in the device. And there is room for that. So that's, but it doesn't change the basic nature of the devices. Okay, thank so you. far we've been able to, I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll talk in the next slide, the challenges that we have uh, and the technology that uh, drives all this, uh, I mean, uh, roadmap of devices and uh, the, the ability, gives us the ability to scale every, uh, every few years and, and what would be the challenges and, and kind of this leads, leads me to one of the way to, I mean, one of the way to scale is to distribute this uh, solution. Yeah. But uh, so the, I mean, the, the classic way to scale is, uh, of course, the silicon process density gives you density and clock speed. But recently, I mean, the, the clock speed doesn't, doesn't grow. Um, I mean, grows very slightly within uh, nodes. So you cannot uh, take the same design, of course, and run it twice as fast and say, okay, I have a double, uh, double bandwidth device anymore. Of Which course, is a uh, very common question. So we, we've been keeping clock speed between one to 1.5 gigahertz for a very long time. Is there really, yeah. is there really significant benefits to increase the clocking? So now I think what we see is maybe uh, around 10% uh, that you can grow between nodes. And also, I mean, there is other issues with the power and, uh, and, and I think mainly the, the challenge is uh, routing. Maybe the gates in the nodes are, are faster, but to connect between them, the traces, then it doesn't allow you, I mean, when you go from one transistor to the other to get a real benefit of just the transistor. So the, the gain is... Uh, is not that much in terms of speed. And probably so memory between... bandwidth is much more severe Sorry? limitation. So there's a question from listeners. Uh, the numbers you provide are aggregate. What is the upper bandwidth limit for a single flow passing through the silicon? Uh, so I think what's, what's interesting in the terms of flow bandwidth is that on the fabric, it's unlimited. We can, uh, let's say we have a device of, uh, 14.4 uh, terabit. Theoretically, you can have a 14.4 terabit flow. Uh, however, the Ethernet interfaces that we have, 
uh, are based on the mostly on the standard, so 400 gig, 800 gig, and uh, uh, I mean in Jericho to C plus it's 400 gig. In the next device it will be coming device it will be 800 gig, and uh, looking into the future 1.60. So uh, this is the limitation on the Ethernet interface, but on the fabric because we spray, we can take a single flow of. Uh, uh, 14 terabits and and pass it from one side to the other. So that's so the uh, flow that is larger than uh, Ethernet interface will yes. come in. You will properly spray it across the fabric, yeah. but then egress will push back. Yeah, if you if eventually you have to, for example, there was uh, there are some. Uh, service provider use cases where we use interlocking interface uh, in some of our devices or OTN interfaces that sometimes can uh, aggregate a larger bandwidth. So, uh, but in Jericho 2C+, uh, the interfaces are 400 gigi and uh, we are coming up with 800 gigi uh, just now. So this is... Uh... So practically we could say that the Upper limit is really the max speed of an interface. You're not limited yeah. by the fabric itself. Yeah. So, what there are some cases where customer might uh, take uh, multiple interfaces of uh, Ethernet and and do inverse multiplexing on them. So they they can take a flow and uh, kind of spray some packets over those interfaces. So in that case they can generate a flow bigger than uh, uh, the maximum port speed, but it requires some work on the uh, on the endpoint. So you're describing something like flex E, Ashen. Um Yeah, it can be flex E or something else, but uh, it, to simplify, yeah, um, the, the maximum flow with, with using Ethernet interfaces is the maximum Ethernet uh, interface speed. Okay, so there's another question from the listeners. So a single flow can be 400 gig. Does it mean that the forwarding chip can look up 400 gig flow? I think yes. the answer is yes, but yeah. yeah, of course, yes. Okay, please continue. Okay, so uh, so the different. Uh, of course, the, the, the third speed is important between generation, uh, but uh, again, it's becoming recently challenging uh, for building pizza boxes or chassis. It becomes more and more challenging because your insur insur insertion loss becomes uh, bigger and bigger as the baud rates uh, in keep increasing. Uh, and it looks like we are staying longer on uh, PAM4. Uh, so, uh, um, starting with 50 gig service, going to 100 gig service, and then 200 gig service, it's become more and more challenging. So you have to find solution for that as well. Even in the pizza box, to to route the uh, the traces from the chip into the front panel becomes more and more uh, difficult. So there are. Of course, different technologies like better PCB material, better connectors. Sometimes you have to use some retimers, but you want to avoid it because retimers means increasing power. There is copper cage optics and uh, discussions and uh, technologies coming up and flyover cables, uh, meaning that you can connect the, the cabling directly into the package of the switch, and then uh, you don't have to go through uh, the PCB uh, and uh, reduce your insertion loss and reduce your power. But these technologies, I mean, it's they are challenging and requires a lot of uh, investment and work to, to make them work correctly or to, to make them, uh, let's say, uh, deployable and at high volume. Since so, you, since you uh, specified or mentioned the package optics, uh, we've seen announcement from your colleagues on XGX on two platforms. One is hybrid, uh, half port electrical, half optical. The 51 Terra, I believe, is coming all uh, CPO. What's the strategy for DNX? 
So uh, we are uh, we take the advantage that we have in Broadcom these technologies, and we can uh, leverage them between the different teams, the XGS and the NX team. So the XGS uh, is starting with the Tomahawk line, and uh, what's nice, I think, is that. Uh, uh, our Ramon uh, device is uh, becoming very similar in terms of the package and uh, the interfaces. The internals are different, but uh, the, the package and interfaces are very similar to Tomahawk. So when you do that, you can leverage the same design into Ramon as well. Uh, so this will be uh, probably next in line. Um, so... Uh, so anyway, the, there is a lot of different technology trying to overcome the the service uh, the service issue, and on a and when we talk about chassis, it's uh, it's even more challenging because you have to traverse a backplane connector, uh, so that's even more challenging. So there is kind of other uh, techniques like flyover cables and things like that that kind kind of makes your uh, chassis instead of uh i mean it's kind of connecting the ramon chip and the jericho chip with uh, some kind of cables instead of uh, going through pcb traces or at least for some of the the traces uh, of course uh, in terms of scaling in the bandwidth so if the speed doesn't give you that the process doesn't give you the speed you 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 may need to scale within the package, so you start seeing architecture with multiple chipset, multiple chiplet uh, over an interposer. So you can kind of grow uh, instead of having the reticle limit, which is about close to 800 millimeters square. Uh, now you can grow to interposer, which has which are 2x, 3x, 4x, and uh, and uh, have more more silicon uh, inside a single package and it, that creates a lot of other uh, complexities and challenges and there is also 3d stacking uh, where you can uh, like hbm where the this is a kind of high bandwidth memory that you can uh, can connect to uh, to have the debuffer and this resides inside the package and uh, there are Technology like SOIC and others that allows you kind of to stack uh, to stack uh, 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 silicon uh, one on top of the other. Like for example, you can put uh, the memory of the device uh, on one uh, silicon and uh, the data on the other, and get very high uh, bandwidth between them. Like as if they are on the same silicon. But again, this is technologies that are coming up, but uh, they have a lot of challenges as well. So I guess we will see something like that in the future. And we are working kind of on all of the, the, these different technologies, but they have their limits as well. And of course, thermal becomes uh, more challenging over time. So packaging technology and how you dissipate this power keeps uh, being more challenging. Total power grows, power density grows. Uh, I mean, the main thing you are getting from the silicon process today is like maybe around uh, 20 to 30 uh, percent decrease in power. But this is assuming you are doing the same thing. But since we want to double the, the bandwidth, kind of if you take a device, which is the power X, if you put double the, the, the bandwidth, you kind of get the power of 2x, and then let's say uh, you save 30% in the process if you go to the next node. So you get uh, something like uh, 1.4x in the total uh, power in roughly the same um, roughly the same area or more. So you double, your power density grows like almost 60% uh, or 70%. So what it really means is that two generations from now, if we don't do anything, you won't be able to cool down the box. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always kind of uh, 
the thing that we are uh, saying, oh, how, what, what can we do, uh, what we can, can we do next? But uh, it seems like the technology is, uh, there are other like uh, so, um, liquid cooling and some other uh, interesting technologies and uh, heat sinks, special heat sinks. And so I don't know, I mean, it becomes challenging. That's what I can, what I can say. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I don't know where, where it ends, if in two years, four years, 10 years, uh, it's hard to say. Ah, since you touched upon machine learning, the demand for bandwidth is crazy and growing, right? Yeah. So yeah, we are over near the end. So now you need to figure out how to cool down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the demand keeps uh, keeps coming. I mean, that, yeah. it doesn't end. So, uh, so, I mean, the last part is that you need to figure out uh, also some architecture innovation and how to how to grow your uh, uh, bandwidth. Uh, so of course there is functionality trade-off. Sometimes you 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 can uh, get rid of some functions to make the uh, the device uh, smaller. Uh, of course, uh, you talk more about distributed architecture while while you take uh, one. <clears throat> let's say pipeline and you multiply the pipeline and connect them and get more bandwidth. I think what's nice is that our architecture was built this way from the, from the start. So when we uh, started doing the, the chassis, uh, we scaled using multiple line cards. So here sometimes a device is kind of uh, like integrating multiple line cards into a single device. So this is very kind of natural to us, but still you need to, uh, when you do it on a single device, there is also overhead because you have to connect everything together. Um, but it gives you a way of scaling. We, instead of in a single device, you can scale with uh, multiple uh, devices. Um, and uh, I think this takes us to uh, kind of evolving from a single uh, chassis into kind of a big logical switch which kind of evolved into what we call the DDC. So this is kind of another way to, to beat this uh, curve of being able to get the chip with the highest bandwidth. Instead of that, you can kind of connect a lot of these chips into a, uh, a single system. So kind of this is a trend that we started uh, maybe five, six years ago, maybe more. Um, and uh, and the DDC, in, in fact, is uh, stands for distributed DNX chassis. So in, uh, you can see in the, on the left side, uh, there are different kind of chassis that uh, you see that they are uh, pre-built. They can hold uh, a lot of a lot of bandwidth in a single uh, rack, and they might have. Uh, 16 line cards of uh, 36 by 400, for example, uh, and, this, and the fabric cards that goes with it. Uh, but then it becomes more and more challenging to integrate like the next generation. If you need to integrate now 16 line cards of 800 gig, uh, and each line card uh, has uh, 36 by 800, and the next step this 36 by uh, 1.60 so it's become more and more challenging uh, to pack all this power density in a single rack and uh, and connect everything together so this is something that happens in parallel it's still uh, this chassis line keeps going but uh, it might be more challenging to big the, the biggest uh, chassis so on the other hand, you can just take the line cards, build a box uh, with, the, let's say, the Jericho device, build a box with the Ramon device, and connect it with cables. And this, you have kind of a, a logical uh, chassis, which is distributed over uh, multiple uh, boxes, but gets you the same functionality. So this is logically uh, a, single, uh, a single router, a single switch, and that gets all the benefits that we talked previously, the end-to-end -end scheduling, the spraying, the self-healing, uh, debuffering if needed. So you get the same uh, capabilities. 
So uh, question to DDC: uh, How much of the difference in cable length is tolerated when you connect fabrics to line cars? Can you have different fibers? Do they must be same lengths? How do you work around this? Um, so, um, um, so first of all, um, we allow, I think, a reasonable configuration with 100 uh, of meters uh, distances between the devices. And uh, also we allow uh, skewing the, the cables. Uh, so the current uh, generation allows some uh, uh, level of skewing. But this grows uh, with the generation, so the coming generation will have more. Um, and uh, of course, because you deploy this, uh, uh, or we'll talk about the, the, let's say, the first deployments or the big deployments uh, as a core router, where the scale was, uh, let's say, limited. Or, I mean, the requirement was uh, some few racks. And uh, now it grows more and more. And in, and in the data center, when we, this is kind of the next, what come, comes next, you, you need uh, larger distances. So let me explain where my question is coming from. When you can yeah. configure your fabric for lossless traffic today with PFC and let's say a rocket, you need to know cable length exactly to configure proper buffer carving. And it's kind of configuration intensive depending on cable length, if you look at typical machine learning cluster. Um, uh, why do you think we need to, to configure the cable lens? We don't, we don't. I don't know, I'm asking you. <laughs> no, no, okay, no, okay, I thought you are. Um, no, you don't necessarily need to configure the cable lens. Uh, we need to uh, maybe know the, the round trip time and things like that, but this is kind of, uh, uh, or to have an idea so the end-to-end -end congestion control can work uh, more efficiently, but uh, this is also data that you can get from the system. What are so the latest things before things like you that. actually start doing end-to-end -end congestion control? Sorry? You do some kind of training before you do end-to-end -end congestion control. So you know the round trips, you can approximate lengths and what needs to be done. Yeah, and, and normally this is things that uh, you already also know. It's not, uh, I mean, every system has, has some configuration. It's not, uh, it, it's not supposed to be very tedious, but uh, uh, some basic configuration can, uh, is normally uh, necessary. I mean, you do that when you do PFC in Ethernet, you want to configure the, uh, the right uh, headroom, let's say. To be able to absorb the the the, the, the distance between the hops, right? So this is kind of a, it's even simpler, but uh, uh, but let's say it's the, it's in the same ballpark of configurations. Okay. Cool. So um, so the, uh, the idea this I mean the DDC is just based on two uh, basic boxes. Uh, what we call a network cloud processor, which is the Jericho uh, box, and the network cloud fabric, which is the uh, Ramon box. And they all connect with the optics. So uh, all the interfaces of the switch goes to uh, the front panel, uh, and you can connect them uh, from one to the other. And in this uh, example, um, let's say in the in the Jericho 2 and Ramon generation. This is a standard QSFP, QSFPDD or OSFP uh, connectivity. So you can use the same cabling between them as uh, you use for Ethernet uh, 400 gig e connectivity. It seems like electric or active uh, DAGs becoming more and more interesting solutions in the space, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think uh, anyone that visited OCP could have seen uh, Credo yeah. and Ufi Space. They presented uh, how they can connect uh, with some limited, of course, uh, distance. They can connect with active copper. Uh, if your distances becomes tens of meters or hundreds of meters, of course, you will need optics. But uh, um, with a reasonable uh, distance, uh, uh, you can use active copper. 
Um, yeah, so this is the, um, and actually it changed the way that uh, uh, we view the system and uh, we had uh, worked uh, very closely with at and and they actually deploy today DDC at scale and their uh, core routers uh, run in the, the core traffic. So I think this is um, the, I think it works uh, in two ways or maybe more than two ways. Sorry, there was a question. Uh, no, I just wanted to add that uh, Turk Telecom has announced they're deploying DDC as well. Yeah, there are others. Uh, we can only share uh, what's public. Uh, what's public? <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, we are starting to get uh, more and more uh, uh, public uh, data, and uh, there are more uh, few ones that uh, use DDC. Um, so the, the idea is not just to distribute the uh, the the bandwidth over multiple devices. It's also uh, disaggregated, meaning that the hardware and software can be delivered by uh, different uh, parties. Uh, there are third-party NOS uh, running over Jericho and Ramon, uh, companies like DriveNet that run the, the software and some other uh, OEMs that uh, uh, run the software over the boxes and the hardware comes from someone else. Uh, they build the pizza boxes. Uh, so this is really a disruptive architecture that allows instead of to have everything fully integrated, vertically integrated, like buying from uh, Juniper, Cisco, Nokia, uh, Arista, buying the full uh, chassis, you can kind of buy the hardware from someone, buy the software or the NOS from someone else. So the next natural step in disaggregation would be to disaggregate fabrics from the line cars. As of today, interfaces are proprietary, use different encapsulation, different technologies. What's your view on the evolution towards open interconnect, let's call it? Um, currently, this is the, uh, I agree, this is a proprietary. Um, I mean, we, we need to think about it. And uh, one way is maybe to open this uh, interface to others. Uh, um, but this, I mean, to get all the benefit from the what I kind of mentioned at the beginning, the end-to-end -end scheduling, the spraying in efficient way, uh, this technique is very useful. So uh, I guess there will be some uh, uh, innovation in that uh, area, and we see some variants of that in data centers. Uh, maybe it will evolve to some standard eventually. So we'll have to see. Um, yeah, so this is kind of uh, um, um, Again, the, the, the way that we build the boxes, you can see like uh, the recent uh, NCP device with the Jericho, this is the NCP3 with Jericho 2C plus. So it has 40 ports of 400 gig uh, connecting to the Ramon side on the top and, uh, and 36 by 400 gig E connecting to the ethernet interfaces. Uh, and the NCF is 48 by 400 uh, uh, interfaces, so theoretically you can connect 48 NCP3 in a single uh, single tier, like an a NCP and NCF tier. Uh, so this is uh, in a single tier, of course you can connect it also in two tiers of NCF. So you so can get in a huge, huge routers. Today it's on you and you get the opportunity to deploy Greenfield and uh, really match stuff. Four years from now, you're going to have three different generations of hardware. Would we be able to mix different generations of Jericho and Ramon in the same logical chassis? Uh, yes, of course. So uh, I think that the way we are working, uh, and this is for many, many years also in the chassis, I mean, the uh, everybody building a chassis wants to uh, 
keep their investment going and uh, if they build a chassis with certain uh, fabric and line cards, they want to be able to put newer line cards. So our most kind of uh, the thumb rule for us is that devices are interoperable one generation forward slash one generation backward. Okay. So two generation normally, uh, sometimes we can do more, but uh, it uh, simplifies when we do one generation forward. In many cases, uh, uh, because of demand of bandwidth, it's more efficient. Uh, so not it does to look like a perfect architecture for access. And in access, we would typically use something like Qumran, Qumran 2C, this class of devices. Can we build this kind of system with Qumran instead of Jericho's? Um, so Qumran, the, the main difference uh, with Qumran, Qumran is like uh, the same functionality of a Jericho, but all the interfaces is Ethernet. There is no uh, our, uh, there is no proprietary fabric interface. So uh, when you do that, then you have the Ethernet standards and capabilities. We don't currently support uh, the, the the spraying and the end-to-end -end scheduling over. Uh, Ethernet interfaces. Okay. This is kind of the we have uh, we have thoughts about that, uh, and it might be coming in the future. But this is not yet uh, something we support. So if you do it today, you just deploy standalone pizza box if you run BGP in between and so forth. Yeah. So there is a pizza box uh, that you can use as a Qumran and then. Uh, uh, run it as fully Ethernet without the fabric interface. And then this is uh, like a router, a smaller router. You don't, you don't uh, scale it uh, uh, like a logical switch. This would be uh, uh, each one its own router if you connect it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, and this is kind of, uh, the way to build, uh, instead of uh, having the limit uh, uh, of a single uh, chassis, you can uh, scale it uh, to any size you want. We'll talk about some advantages later, but uh, I think what's nice also is that the ecosystem that builds around it, so the advantages of the technology allows you to uh, kind of, uh, like on top of the DNX chipset with the debuffering, lossless fabric, end-to-end -end congestion control, and perfect load balancing. It actually is deployed in many different applications, uh, DCI switches, edge routers. So some of them is a chassis deployment. Some of them would be DDC. Some of them standalone devices. They all have the same, the same capabilities, packet processing capabilities, debuffering, end-to-end -end scheduling, etc. So we see deployment uh, from uh, different sizes and different uh, applications, uh, from service provider to DCI, uh, from appliances, uh, sorry. Um, and, and lately, machine learning, this is kind of the, the new uh, exciting uh, market for us. So this is, uh, and you see that there's many players and many different uh, NOS, uh, uh, options. Uh, so, of course, some of them are uh, vertically integrated, uh, but some of them are uh, uh, disaggregated. Uh, so, DriveNet and Sonic and uh, FBOS and uh, Oversize, so this is also uh, being supported. So as a side note, uh, if you're looking into a lot of really technical details of implementation, both Cisco and uh, Juniper publish really, really good uh, blog post documentation on using DNS on their platforms. So it's in CS and Cisco case and the CX on uh, Juniper. Documentation is really, really good. OK. Um, so kind of. What, what DDC gives you, uh, so um, it's a simple solution and you can uh, extensively, like you can scale it uh, as you grow. Uh, and the hardware itself becomes lower cost because uh, it's built by a third party that uh, uh, takes the, the, I mean, charge only for the hardware itself. 
and there is competition of the different hardware vendors. There's multiple ODMs building the hardware boxes. Uh, it's a low penetration cost because you can build, you don't, I mean, you don't need to buy a chassis of 16 slot and uh, um, let's say uh, use in the beginning just uh, a few line cards because you want to grow in the future. Uh, in this case, you can kind of buy one box, uh, two Jericho boxes and Ramon. Uh, depending on your scale, and then grow as you as you need. If you need more boxes, you connect uh, more Jerichos or more Ramones, and you scale. Uh, and of course, the the software is disaggregated, so you can have competition there as well, or you can have open source software. So this is very, uh, uh, very nice ecosystem. And of course, you get uh, the advantages uh, of the. Um, the flexi flexible power facility planning. So uh, let's say the power on your rack doesn't support a 16 slot rack, uh, uh, chassis, uh, but you can uh, instead you can put as many uh, as many boxes as fit in the in a single rack and grow by having multiple racks. Uh, of course, it, it takes more space, but it allows you to get the scale without uh, limiting your, uh, uh, without uh, the limit of your uh, power per rack. So it's more flexible planning of the, uh, how you deploy these devices. And, and you get the, the, the rest of the benefits. Just before you continue, this one is very, very important. Data centers are designed and deployed year in advance before you actually put them into the ground and power to each rack to each row is predefined and cannot be exceeded so ability to receive in such way could be very very important as you upgrade towards higher bandwidth yeah uh, yeah this is a and and sometimes your uh, uh yeah uh, uh, sometimes your uh, power and electricity planning uh, sometimes you 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 plan uh, and you have some in one generation, some power uh, per rack, and then you can grow it. So yeah, you, you can kind of uh, be very uh, flexible and dynamic with that. So that's the, one of the advantage uh, that customers tell us that th this is kind of uh, appealing to them. Um, yeah, I mean, and the rest of the feature set is just the baseline architecture that gives you the fault tolerance, the load balancing, the the scalability and the end-to-end -end scheduling, etc. So this is kind of uh, you you get the, the the same benefit, but you can scale uh, with the DDC. So uh, so now we go to the to kind of the, the new exciting uh, opportunity that uh, this DDC opened uh, and. Uh, I think what we see is that uh, recently, I mean, the, the, the trend is that in, in, an, uh, in, let's say everywhere, the machine learning uh, cluster is, is being built very, very rapidly. And the growth is, is significant, uh, amazing in terms of quantities. Uh, and it's growing larger. I mean, it, it's growing fastest, even, even faster than the traditional cloud compute at least from what we are uh, seeing the numbers. Uh, and we see also that it's not that you put more uh, more GPUs or more uh, accelerators to, uh, to carry the compute of this uh, machine learning workload, but the scale increases because the model size increases and the amount of training data. So you have to distribute it over huge amount of GPUs. It's no more that you can run everything on a single GPU. Now there is many workloads that needs to run over tens, hundreds, and even thousands of GPUs running the same workload. Galan, do you have a view on in-network compute? Um, I don't uh, talk about this now, but uh, uh, this is also something very interesting that we are exploring how to uh, to use the the network to uh, to offload uh, 
the GPUs when they do in collective off I mean co collectives. So this will be coming uh, as part of the generations, but uh, um, I'm currently talking mostly about the uh, the deployment or the the opportunities that we see now. We can talk about it more if, uh, if time permits. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion. And for our listeners, so uh, current developments in machine learning often require all gather operations. So there's a lot yeah. of data that's coming from everybody to everybody. So the pattern in last yeah. years has been significantly. So if a network device or a switch, a router can take part of this data, analyze it and then distribute it to each. Uh, Actually, maybe I have a slide that I can kind of okay. uh, a little bit uh, kind of mention it. Uh, maybe so it practically in this case, you can reduce the amount of bandwidth by, by two. Yes, yeah. Um, so maybe I'll touch about it. Uh, and there is kind of a drawing that maybe will be some somewhat helpful. I, I okay. Uh, so anyway, because you scale uh, the workload on on so many GPUs, you need a very efficient network to connect all of these GPUs and uh, kind of uh, minimize the amount of time that uh, these workloads uh, spend on the network. I think uh, some interesting data point was presented by Meta in, uh, in recent OCP that they see around 50% of the time uh, spent on the network. So you want to decrease that as much as possible so your compute becomes more efficient, right? Yep. So this is the kind of uh, the target of, uh, of the network. And you can see dedicated networks that uh, each workload is running over multiple GPUs, but you can also probably in, like running deep learning, a recommendation model, a natural language understanding. I mean, I'm not uh, the expert on machine learning, but kind of we are learning a little bit about it from uh, what we understand from our customers or uh, um, and of course there is maybe cloud uh, and multi-tenant network that uh, provide the machine learning services that may in this case GPU might run uh, uh, even multiple workload and kind of to provide some impression of amount of benefits as clusters clusters that are deployed this next year often have 25 to 30 tera of traffic leaving single rack. Just have this yeah. in mind. Yeah, so this, this is really amazing. What we see is that uh, maybe today they are uh, connecting uh, hundreds of uh, uh, accelerators, but uh, the, I think the trend is to build thousands of accelerator communicating uh, with one another. And if each accelerator is uh, 400 gig and the collectives are megabytes uh, or sometimes even gigabytes in size, so you understand, can understand the, the amount of data being transferred uh, on these networks. This is kind of mind boggling. Yeah, so everybody's talking about OpenAI this week because obviously everyone's playing with it. So OpenAI models envision cluster of size of hundred thousands of uh, GPUs or compute nodes. And all yeah. of them need to be interconnected over network. So that's the skill. Yeah, so uh, yeah, of course. I mean, there are maybe supercomputers and uh, HPCs that sometimes have uh, even larger uh, uh, accelerator uh, um, size, but yeah, th this is kind of, uh, the trend is uh, growing and growing and uh, <laughs> nobody knows where it will end, but uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's good for the network, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so of course, uh, when you kind of uh, uh, distribute the machine learning workload, there is kind of a data parallelism, meaning that you take the, let's say, uh, the data itself, and you run some of the data on some GPU, the other data on another GPU, uh, and then you synchronize between them. Uh, 
and there is model parallelism, like taking the, the let's say the neural networks and uh, uh, you might have uh, different uh, uh, stages of the neural networks and you might kind of split some of some of the neural networks into some GPUs and then uh, some of the neural networks in other GPUs. Uh, and the, the training would be kind of going between one to the other to get the full training and going through the full uh, 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 full neural network. Uh, uh, but, but the main point is that uh, you can have both data and model parallelism, and then it means that your uh, overall uh, uh, number of GPUs is growing even larger. And I think what's interesting is the models, they, they have know, billions or trillions of parameters, so they cannot reside, even the, the parameters themselves, they, they cannot reside on a single GPU. They have to be distributed. Um, so I, I think two very common collectives that happen within the GPUs, I mean, there is all gather and, and others, but kind of this is the, the two baseline uh, uh, collectives. One is called all reduce, which means that, uh, let's say you, you did the data parallelism, let's say that this was a set of uh, images and you run maybe a set of images on one GPU and a set of images on another GPU. And then uh, after you run it on each GPU, you want to be able to kind of merge uh, the results from all the GPU. So what happens is that uh, after, let's say in the picture, you see P0, P1, P2, P3. So eventually each one of them does uh, work on some part of the data, but then you have to kind of uh, learn from both, uh, all of them together and move to the next step. So you have to uh, kind of average out uh, the data coming from each one of them. So if you, and, and this is maybe comes back to the collective you, uh, or the, uh, to the uh, in-network computing you were talking about. Uh, so uh, if you don't have the help of the network, you have to send from each, uh, uh, eventually you have to send the, the data you have uh, calculated, the new, uh, new parameters uh, from each node to each other node. So, uh, and then create the averaging and then distribute the averaging to everyone. So one way is to kind of, between the GPUs, create a binary tree or double binary tree or create a, a ring to be able to pass this information efficiently and then result eventually with the, every node having the results from A, B, C, and D. And then the other way is to send it to the network and the network can sum it up and return it back to the GPUs. And this can save you uh, time and, uh, and bandwidth on the network. So that's, that's kind of one way to, uh, for the network to help the endpoints. So to bring in it for a second back to the network. So in typical TCP IP network, we know you lose the packet. Okay, TCP will retransmit it. So here your total computation is based on each individual computation with GPU. If you lose a packet, eventually it's going to be retransmitted, but all other GPUs are going to wait till you have detected that you lost the packet, till you have retransmitted. The cost could go into millions of dollars. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, all these workloads are uh, running over RDMA normally or uh, Rocky over RDMA. And the uh, packet loss is not that uh, friendly to those applications because you have to retransmit and sometimes uh, and, and until all this collective is finished uh, you cannot uh, you cannot continue to the next step so it's uh, it's the the last or the the longest uh, flow determines the whole uh, workload uh, completion time and of course there is also all to all uh, workload which uh, when you do a model uh, parallelism, normally you would, uh, you would need this. And then kind of everybody has to send to everybody the whole picture. So this is very intensive in terms of uh, 
uh, the networking time. Um, so you can see here, uh, I mean, uh, in the all to all, each process sends a lot of data to, to every other process. And it's really intensive on the network. Uh, and it's heavy also on the leaf and spine uh, of the network because uh, it's, it's not limited to a single top of rack or a sim single cluster. It can go between huge number of uh, uh, GPU connected on the network. Um, so th then it comes back to, to our DNX architecture and how this can help uh, in those workloads. So some of the characteristics uh, that we understand for this uh, AI ML network is that there is relatively small number of high bandwidth flows and they are not always e even in the actual bandwidth of each flow. So some of the collectives are not sending exactly the same data between one another because there are uh, some sparsity. Uh, so it creates a, in it creates some imperfect load balancing and uneven link utilization, which is one of the most challenging uh, issue today with this uh, uh, workload. So I think uh, what we bring in the DNS architecture, the fact that we do a perfect load balancing using the sprain, this is a huge advantage that we see in this uh, uh, in this workload. And the second one is that these networks, when they start a collective, it's really the GPUs can burst at full 100% of the network bandwidth they are using. So if we, you have a 400 gig GPU NIC, uh, this will kind of generate, when it does the collective, full 400 gig e bandwidth. So the network is really at 100% utilization for a pretty long period of time. So you need a very efficient network to be able to, to switch between the different uh, top of racks or between different GPUs at full bandwidth. If you don't do that and you have some imperfect load balancing, then it starts creating congestion and, uh, and PFC propagation, etc. So this is really uh, important to be able to switch at very good efficiency and this is where the end-to-end -end scheduling comes as well, because you don't send to the, um, you don't push the data into the network rather than send, but what can be handled by the endpoint. So this is eliminates the buildup on the fabric, creates a fabric which is very low utilized. I mean, very low. Uh, I mean, it's high utilized, but it's uh, the the buffering there is pretty shallow and it doesn't need any PFC propagation or head of line blocking. So this is two, two main aspects. I mean, there are other aspects we talked about, but these two main aspects are uh, really uh, uh, fits well with the machine learning workload. Um, I mean, I can discuss- We are over an hour. Do you feel it would be good to kind of stop now and perhaps continue in a week or two? So it's getting really long and you've got so much interesting information to share. Yeah. Would that work? Um, uh, yeah, it can work. I have a few slides, uh, but uh, yeah, we can continue uh, maybe another uh, 15 minutes or half an hour, I guess. Uh, I still have, uh, but if there are questions, we can have another hour maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be much better to also allow people to ask questions. Okay. Yeah, sure. No problem. So uh, thanks so much so far, uh, dear listeners. So we are going to come back to you with uh, number two, and we will uh, schedule, hopefully within two weeks or so. And uh, Galan, again, thank you so much. I know it's late. Uh, yeah, thank you so very soon. That's really thanks great. a lot for having me. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Jeff. Bye, Sean.